All right, everyone, welcome back to Cloud Computing and Big Data to our lecture 7.1, using deep learning techniques in different cloud environments like we had basically in the first part of the lecture where we explored a little bit the Amazon EC2 AMI images and instances that are there, uh, which provides a very nice way to have the huge jungle of different versions of machine learning tooling, so to speak, uh, controlled in a very nice instance, which is accessible via SSH, but with a trick also accessible via Jupyter. Of course, this lecture part two now will take this up. So we will think about, we have just used CPUs and we heard already in Rocco's lecture and also in Gabriel's lecture that this might be not the best to execute on. So, and we need to, uh, really a good example, I think, to really understand what that means. And that's what we will explore basically uh, in the second part here of the lecture. And we were gonna move away from Amazon more to another space called Google Collab where we then explore a little bit what GPUs, you know, powerful they can be, but what problems can come or arise when you switch cloud environments. So there you have also aha effects. And I wanted to point that also out because here Amazon looks very technical, but there you control really the environment. You have seen which kernel we actually were pointing to, which is an important aspect, uh, which you not really have control over if you go to the Google Collab. Now from <clears throat> deep learning techniques, um, that is basically now um, an older slide that we had already. You remember we had this feature learning discuss at the beginning, but another point was this parameters. I just want to come back to this, right? So when you think about and basically see here a little bit in this nice video, uh, the more, the bigger the network, the more interconnections, but a deep learning network that you have here is essentially not something which has just more and more and more and layers with simple neurons. As Rocco was alluding to and Gabriel earlier, these are layers with specific purposes, with specific, you know, unique properties in each of the different layers. We had pooling layers, we had this feature maps, right, the convolutional layers. So you see here, when you have this digit recognition that we now do, we don't just stick it to something which you see on the top left, right? This would be a typical neural network with one hidden layer and 15 neurons, and every neuron would be interconnected with another neuron. Now you see what deep learning is doing. It does actually quite different approaches. You have still a fully dense net, usually at the end for classification, right? But this here in front, what we said is feature learning, feature extraction, where you really carve out uh, the unique properties of the data in different steps and go closer. Um, this was really now the power of deep learning, the power of convolutional neural networks. Of course, different neural networks like long short term memory have their different benefits for time series or for other areas in deep learning like GANs and so on. But we stick here a little bit with convolutional neural network. Take away the message, however, that this field is so large that you could be just a professorship in deep learning these days. It is so strong that you could not only have a course, uh, I think Gabriel was mentioning it, you could be a master of deep learning just studying nothing else. And it would be probably still too much to learn. There's so much to see in this um, new technology, which is uh, probably the future also, that we have different professors at universities for different fields in deep learning. And we're just touching here on supervised learning, take away the message, there's lots of things in unsupervised learning as well. But it, of course, we cannot do everything in this course, but I want to point you here on this YouTube lectures again, which covers, you know, three days of material um, of where you really can have details uh, looked in. But let's go further. We have seen now essentially the small networks and this picture was also earlier in the course, but now we understand it perhaps better, right? We have seen essentially when we really have big data, um, then we cannot use essentially this kind of serial tools anymore. It doesn't make sense. So we would use more and more deep learning networks, but when we do so, we increase the number of parameters hyperparameters and need much more training time. However, as we've seen in the number recognition from the small, let's say multi-output perceptron to the one with you know two medium or hidden layers, there you would have accuracy improvement. And now what deep learning is promising is by paying the price of more training time, 
um, can I really improve on accuracy? And we were quite high, if you remember, right? So we were already, with a number of APOS of 200 maybe, already to quite 94%. So can we reach 100%? That's the question here. And a typical machine learning expert would say, 100% in machine learning is impossible. And this has relationships to overfitting, to noise in the data, which is regularly there. There are always some certain elements in the data that you cannot really learn. So the best we hope to achieve might be rather 99%. Now, an interesting element to maybe explore with you, um, you have seen another tool with um, basically Gabriel is, uh, you know, these tools in the internet that show you really how it works. A lecture slide of a professor couldn't carry the essence of that. If you paint, for instance, here in this tool and you have the reference in the slide, you much better understand how the input now is digested over different convolutional layers, building different feature maps, as we discussed, having different properties of the data carved out. And then basically in the last layers here, we see it's most likely an eight, but as the six and the eight are very similar, you see that the probability of the six is also relatively high, but it is definitely an eight here. And this is related now to the ones that we have in these different uh, carved out learned features, right? And this is of course similar when you have a zero and an eight, you would say, um, this is a zero, yeah, but you see a little bit is here also the six and the eight again active because they share certain elements. And this is just explaining you a little bit. You can do lots of playing around here. Um, I just give you this tool at hand if you really want to understand it. Maybe uh, I think this is a pretty nice tool uh, to do so, which no slide set ever would could ever you know transfer. Now let's look what we do or what we have to do when we want to go to convolutional networks. And as I said, it's a practical lecture, which means you also have the same, of course, here in our beautiful Nupita notebook. Uh, we have seen the, um, basically the one with two hidden layers neural network stops essentially at 94% accuracy. The test score I should mention is basically the evaluation of the loss function. Um, that you basically have heard also in Rocco's course, it's basically more calculated when you create and build models, while accuracy is usually much more applied. So once the training is done and everything, you rather check the accuracy. So, but you can take away the message that the higher the accuracy, usually the test score should be going down, right? Because that is related to each other. But what we want to do is firstly, maybe show you another interesting thing when I meant of, you see it's running here, and when I know, for instance, and now um, just close that here, you remember I don't do this close and held, what you should always do. So I'm the bad guy here. I do this and you see it's still running, right? And this is an important takeaway message that you should keep in mind in the cloud. If you don't, you know, close things properly, they're still running, even if you don't see that. And they actually, what would they would do if you have a very cutting edge GPU behind it, they will get your credits down without you knowing because all your brother's uh, browser images basically show nothing, nothing is there. And suddenly you open this, you know, console again and you see, oh, I have been 200 euros less credits. So that's something really to remember if you're in production. So the recommendation is not just, you know, use this browser functionalities, usually use a proper Jupyter technology. And we have to say to all of us, all of us sometimes do it because we're so used to click just there. Um, in this sense, it's a common problem. It's nothing which you know is broken. As I said earlier, you can go back to the instances, you um, either reboot the instance or stop the instance, come later back. Um, that's of course important. And here in the assignment, these are just cents, right? We talked about that this micro instance here costs one cent per minute. So also if you keep it running in this example, it's much, let's say, less costly than having our elastic map reduce we had the last time. But we want to explore a little bit convolutional network. So that's the second part here. We have now the CNN that you already all have for your assignment. Um, we see now the kernel is loaded, the kernel is idle. As usually, we want to basically restart the kernel and clear all the output to make it clean here. And <clears throat> the structure of the CNN is, of course, a little bit different, as you know. It's just not adding to more and more dense layer and dense layer. We basically start the same way. We import from Keras, of course, now different layers. 
um, not only a dense layer, which is the same for, let's say, artificial neural networks that we know. Now we have different elements like convolutional 2D, max pooling 2D, um, all of these elements, which Gabriel really step-by-step -step in lecture six introduced, um, creating then the feature maps over time. And what we did here is basically the same we had before with the same input problem, but we exchange essentially the model building of just creating a small class here where we build this up in the way, same way we have a sequential buildup of the neural network we had before. Instead, of course, as I said, different layers now, right? With a specific, um, uh, basically, architecture that we derive from one very well-known, um, uh, you know, existing convolutional neural network that exists already that in the past was always very strong at image recognition problems. And we just basically have here the same properties with the pooling. We decide what type of pooling here it is max pooling. So the strongest signal survives. We also learned in Gabriel and Rocco's um, lectures that this is a form of dimensionality reduction, right? So I, from this um, different pool sizes, I reduce here significantly the data. What you have also seen in the valley in these areas here, you go to smaller and smaller if you want patches, so to speak. But in a way, it's it's not accurate patches. It's even the signal compressed and more um, basically pooled together. So. As I also said, um, <clears throat> once we learned the features given through these two convolutional layers here, um, we do a nonlinear activation function with ReLUs, um, rectified linear units. There comes a way where still a normal neural network more or less is there. It basically puts out the probabilities. Uh, this is also in the visualization here, um, if I can get to it. Uh. Um, essentially demonstrated here, right? So you see here, still every neuron here is connected with every other neuron. And it will basically have then a probability distribution with this 10 digits now um, put out and it's never hundred percent usually, although it's very clear here in this case, um, but this is where exactly this, this setup is. So you see there's a dense net and what we do here is the activation function softmax which is usually also often used for this classification problems to basically press now um, these kind of um, values that we get out into different classes from zero to nine. You see also similar like in the other ones, um, I just of course also use this and activate this. We've seen here the number of epochs. Um, we, I put here 20 to be comparable to the other, but I changed Adam. We said, you know, we can have different optimizers. If you remember the batch size, we could vary. Um, here's a validation split, which refers a little bit to a more advanced uh, machine learning, uh, you know, course where you normally would study this much more to basically combat overfitting with validation and regularization, a proper way of finding parameters, so to speak. All of that we cannot teach in this course. So that's why I always recommend if you're interested in that, take a proper machine learning course also afterwards. We here put much more emphasis of using these models than in the cloud with cutting edge computing. The number of classes is clear. We need some input shapes. The difference, however, here is if you think about the reshaping and the flattening of the input signal, we here don't do that. Because essentially what we have is we don't need to make it as one vector. We can put directly the image in. And this is of course very nice. You see and remember maybe, I think Gabriel Rocco had an example of this RGB, like three times the image in different color schemes. Here we have it of course once, but still we just keep it as multidimensional. There's no point of doing it as a vectorized. So this is a, another interesting aspect to it. And you remember what the benefit was. It was a locality. Right now we keep the locality of this um, image. The pixel on the left is somewhat related to the pixel on the right. If you vectorize the neural networks in normal neural networks, you lose that. You vectorize and they're just roughly related to each other in the very little neighborhood, but you lose a lot of connections. So our assumption is by capturing this in feature maps that we have up here, um, on a dependent pool size which fits to it and kernel size which fits to the problem, um, given a 28 by 28 pixels image, right? Then we capture this locality in the image. And with this, 
our hope is to improve the classifier from 94%, hopefully to 99%. And we will see if it will fulfill the promise. The rest of this is what you know. So essentially we need to compile the model. Um, we have the number of classes. We define the optimizer from the top. We want to know the, the accuracy. And you know, again, compiling doesn't do much things. Basically it just prepares a TensorFlow graph structure for executing. But of course, then basically you have um, here the model fit, which now is working. And now here the aha effect hopefully starts by everyone looking at this when we start the training, because we need lot time. Why is that? Right, so this is what we now asking. So it was so beautiful fast before, and now I have just 20 EPOS, if I want to have 200 EPOS here on a CPU, um, we basically talking about maybe the course I was on Thursday, right? You see definitively now by switching to CNNs, and having the same environment, we nothing changed in the environment. We're still on the micro CPU within basically our Amazon AMI instance. And yeah, we, we cannot here demonstrate that quickly. How sad is that? And let us reveal a little bit where the problem relies on that. The key trouble we have with this is although deep learning tries with weight sharing, and you know other elements we see subsampling maybe that you have you know basically through the max pooling for example automatically we still have a lot of trainable parameters if you remember the one with two hidden layers from a neural, normal neural network what was a dense interconnected one had basically uh, still let's say 120,000 parameters but now we go here we have a cutting edge um, let's say uh, convolutional neural network, which is very good and stand the test of time for many of the, let's say, smaller problems. It's not like ResNet 50, like Rocco had as an example, or I come to back later, but still it does a good job, but you pay the price for it. You see 1.2 million trainable parameters. And if you remember now, um, although you do weight sharing and everything, you still have to update all of those. In the optimization, you have to take the derivative, you have to update with a weight rule, nothing changed. We're still at back propagation, right? And even the time series models with LSTM, they do the same with back propagation. It's just called back propagation through time, uh, adding a small trick essentially to, to combat the vanishing gradient. But you see here the explosion in parameters, which is happening, contributing to the fact that when I want to basically finish this year for you as an example in the course, uh, in this practical lecture, we have a very long time to go. However, it looks promising. Our validation accuracy already shows 98%. So when we would have more coffee, maybe we can get to a better model. And this is really, I wanted to show in this environment. So um, you can imagine uh, everything I talked inside basically this Jupyter notebook. Again, you find on the slides, right? Described as I would talk. Um, the optimizer setup, we have now this, you know, we have a basically a different mattress now that we can stick directly into the neural network because we have a deep learning convolutional neural network, not a one times flattened artificial traditional neural network. That's a very important takeaway message. And of course, when you do assignment two, you will explore that yourself. So then it's much more easier probably also to notice. We had this interesting um, accuracy. I take the, let's say, aha effect a little bit, you know, from your assignment. You should reach that after a long time and you see we fulfill the promise. So it's 99.36% after 20 epochs. And if you continue even with 200, um, you may come even to a little bit of better model in the percentage, but in the in the way the community would say, this is not relevant so more because there's some fluctuations in that given the optimization nature, right? You don't have really a closed term solution or something analytical, basically of numerics and then basically taking the derivative optimization, which inherently will never give you the same direct way of, you know, the percentage that is here, but usually it's, it's very similar, of course. But we see also that no matter how much EPOS you put, you cannot reach 100% in this learning. Now, the big question is why we can't do that? The one is of course, when you reach 100, then you have nothing else done than learning the training set. You memorize it, right? When you reach 100, usually 
this is a very, very bad idea. And the reason is, as an example here on the bottom right, you see in many places, of course, here it's really understandable from us humans, uh, because even we cannot recognize some of the data samples. And this is a real data sample, right? It was characters that were on letters. So people write like that in, in, in real life. So when we want to understand that, of course, you have a very hard time of understanding those samples. And those actually would be, let's say, considered noise for the training because nobody really knows what it is and what it really should be. So we would label it wrongly we would maybe say this looks a little bit like a two, but actually the someone thinks more of a three. The other one, it's also personal in some opinions. The other one would put it differently. Right, so, so much for this. Um, you see now why we cannot reach 100%. Um, we can execute this nicely here. And if you wait, indeed, it will come to a, a very close 99.9 .9 something. So this is working nicely. And as you see now with waiting for that a long time, we can always go back. I can show you this. You see, we're still somewhere plunging around here in Epoch 2 and it does a job over time, but this is not really nice. And what we did was having a toy problem, right? It was 28 by 28 pixels. So you have seen uh, from a recent paper from Rocco and Gabriel and me, that we use something like 96 GPUs to have really production problems, really remote sensing data uh, crunched down in terms of runtime. Because if you would do this now with this interesting CPU setup, you will basically never finish. It will be a hopeless endeavor. And this shows you the power of distributed training. It also shows you to, to really go back to this kind of trainable parameters. This ResNet, what also Rocco introduced, uh, that basically is then usable with Horowat as one example. He also explained deep speed would be equally possible. But you have here the problem of even more millions of parameters, right? We had 1.2 millions and we wait a long time. So what do you think when we wait for 25.6 millions of trainable parameters? Although ResNet 50 is considered to be very good and basically it had this interesting uh, skip connections here, which also add to this. Uh, strong property, but still having so many interactions uh, and updates of the weights will take a long time. And this is even with cutting edge V100. I mean, there are new GPUs coming up um, basically very soon in, in most of the cloud setups today. But this was already, let's say, a, a major way how clouds now can solve really big data problems, right? We cannot do the big data problems completely in the cores, otherwise we run out of credits quickly because also what the nice thing in Rocco's presentation, in my opinion, was he put it to the fact back to the credits, if you remember, right? If you now compute this, if you want to rent 96 GPUs, V100s in the Amazon cloud or Azure, right? Then go there and pay the price for it. This would be, let's say, quite a lot of money. The hope is, of course, in the future, that would be not the case, but then there will be more cutting edge deep learning uh, frameworks and, and things like that available. So with this, the challenge a bit remains, right? Having access to this cutting edge GPUs, which is, let's say, a pleasure of scientists and academics that they get this for free, as Gabriel and Rocco also were alluding to, they don't pay anything for this. While, of course, commercials that get something out of it really for, let's say, getting, turn something into money. But we will explore then in lecture eight, lecture nine, lecture 10 now, when we do infrastructure, plat uh, ISO service, platform as a service and software as a service models. Then, of course, you, you basically get income based on what you have here, you know, paid out for Amazon. Right, but let's go a bit further. Um, we have also seen it's getting to more hardware complexity here. So I can go carry on and, you know, and see the difference between MapReduce, Spark, things you know from earlier lectures and think what is better in terms of distribution? Is it better to use MPI, message passing interface like Horovod, for instance? So this is all something getting to really technical elements and then also hardware. We see more and more improvements on hardware sites because there's specific hardware coming up for GPUs kind of structures. We will explore in Google Collab where we have even TPUs which are not on the market, right? So these are things, tens of 
processing units, which basically nobody from us can buy and only some vendors have access. And this is a future, the same as we do research with network attached memory, things which are not really on the market. So, so specific hardware created for basically deep learning is basically happening right now. And we see that uh, quite distributed now in, in more and more vendors. Um, we see big races between AMD in terms of GPUs, in terms of you know the race with NVIDIA GPUs. So also the accelerators get more broadly used. But all of this contributes to the fact that if you want to have good performance, which we see here, right? And also the usage of that over the years, um, more and more hardware impact needs to be known. Uh, also when, what also Rocco was alluding to this mini batch sizes, right? His PhD was a little bit about the batch sizes, large batch sizes and so on. So what impact does it have? You really have to take into account a lot of different elements. And with this, I would stop it here because this is a kind of cloud computing course, which actually is more on the 10,000 feet perspective on clouds and machine learning, while we have the hardware elements and how to program really yourself in parallel is done in my complementary course in high performance computing coming next spring. So if you're interested to learn more how actually this is working, uh, feel free to enroll. The current setup is that I teach this in spring again and you're welcome to basically jump in. It's really some things which you really have as an overlap, uh, which maybe makes it nicely and connects it really as a complementary course. And here goes the marketing, right, for the spring lecture, but uh, feel free to enroll. Another area where I want to say is, um, you know, we just scratched the surface with Amazon services and I picked particularly the AMI image because it's based on what we learned in lecture four with virtual clusters. You feel it by hand what it means to create an instance. You could have different services in Amazon. I mean, they are very strong in, in these services. And here's one good example that we will pick up in lecture 10 where you know all of these interesting tricks we just done with SSH minus L to be the touch metal on the instance, uh, you don't really have to do, right? So this is most more for you uh, to really, you know, understand what clouds are, how the virtualization works there, what the instance relationship is and the versioning problem. Here in Amazon SageMaker, all you have to do is to create kind of pipelines in a very beautiful integrated development environment for machine learning. And underneath is somewhere this AWS cloud. Of course, the higher the service, the more you pay. The beautiful thing, however, is you see on the top right here, it's included in the free tier. So I urge anyone, if you want to play around, please do so. We will come to it back in lecture 10, but you know we have a limited amount of course hours, so I cannot make a practical lecture out of it, but it's also a very interesting service um, that basically you should not miss. And you know already it's also accessible via Jupyter. Now the last basically uh, 10 minutes here um, today, I want to put here now the, the spot on a different cloud service, leaving Amazon for a while and putting another problem into perspective. When you are in this field and we're doing this since quite a while now, maybe 10 years uh, where I do this kind of scripts for machine learning, deep learning, we have seen a lot of things and technology is you know created so quickly that basically every month or every two months when you have something running, you have to review it. It's either a new GPU that comes along with Kepler, Pascal, suddenly Volta GPUs and new libraries or higher level libraries change. You see here a trace error that you, we basically will explore here hands-on by of course closing properly here our CNN in the in this um, Amazon environment and we say thank you because it doesn't really work. It came not very close to convergence. So by having done so, we would like to close a few things of these. Um, actually remember if you want also to stop the instance that would make sense if you don't use it, right? Otherwise, of course you pay because Amazon wouldn't care if you're really locked in or not, it's still working. Um, but what we want to have is now the Google Collab environment, right? And I talked about this already with you and we have seen a video in one of the lectures, which is essentially the idea of having this Jupyter-like structure in the Google Cloud equipped directly with resources. And uh, this is a very nice overview, particularly also because it's directly bound, as you see here, to my OneDrive, 
right? So I see directly that these IPython notebooks are available in my OneDrive. And when I click them, um, let's say the one that I gave you, I could open it directly with a Google Collaboratory. And this is nice. And with this comes a couple of free resources even, and even GPUs are for free. Um, and even if you spend nine, 99 per month, you actually get, let's say, quite good resources. But of course, also when you move from one cloud to another, you explore basically the following. And that highlights why particularly also Amazon was quite nice. So here you see now the same script I gave you as part of the assignment for Amazon. Now, if you want to do the same assignment in, in basically the collaboratory, you would have a little bit of problem. So first of all, we would think, uh, by the way, we want to have a runtime here that you can pick nicely in, in the Google Collaboratory. We would maybe want to have the hosted runtime in the cloud. So we pick this. It would take a little bit time of connecting, but as usual, Google is very good in these services. So that's not a problem. So rather the versioning is a problem here. So you see, we just have this and what we also can steer a little bit of course would be here, change the runtime type. But this is usually just saying, do I have none, which means no, no GPU, essentially saying just CPUs. Or do I want a GPU or do I want a TPU? I was alluding to this very specific hardware that's actually just available here in the Google Cloud, right? Which is a tensor processing Unix partic particularly designed for deep learning and neural networks. And of course, very fast. But what we wanted to have is now GPUs. And of course, it's not really one that is, you know, cutting edge, as we will learn um, when you don't pay the price of nine euro 99 uh, or nine dollar 99, I think. But at least we get GPUs for free, so it should be faster. The problem, however, you arise in this, we created this with an old version of Keras, right? This the same script. And basically now, if we go through this, you have the same that I was showing on the slides. You have these typical bugs that you have to go back and then essentially now modify your creation of the architecture to the new Keras version. And as Keras moves and TensorFlow significantly moved in the past, and now we have a TensorFlow 2, we luckily see that everything gets a bit more stable, right? In the last, let's say five to 10 years where deep learning really had a hype, this was really a lot of work, always adding scripts and getting the infrastructure right. So now we come really to a way where more people are using it, it's get more stable. But essentially, as you see here, you cannot really work with the code I provided simply in the Google Colab. Why? It has different versions of Keras. And here, in contrast to the Amazon one, I cannot really put back the kernel that I was initially editing, which was maybe TensorFlow 1, and now it's operating on TensorFlow 2 and the different Keras version, etc. But this really demonstrates the usual challenges you have when you do cloud computing, right? We have to put, build this advantages in the course, which means very nice, for instance, in, in Amazon to have the versioning right between all the different packages and go back to very old versions to keep old scripts because also customers are less likely to pay you again for the same service that you created, right? So what I'm speaking of is software maintenance and here my invited colleagues from Adesso, they can speak a lot about what it means to maintain old codes and maintenance in software engineering. So this is definitely something um, to consider, which is problematic. However, of course, on a, on a good notice, um, we can go back to my OneDrive here. And of course, I had a little bit of time of, you know, updating this to a newer version, which fits the right versions, just to show you a little bit what you also then uh, basically is part of the next assignment, not assignment two. This will be rather the one where you explore CPUs are quite slow in lecture in assignment three, you will then basically explore this a little bit as well. So again, similar like before, we would say we connect to the hosted runtime in the cloud. Um, this takes a little bit of while. So basically you see the same structure of the code. We still have the model here with convolutional and layers with pooling. We have this flattening, if you remember at the end to go to the dense network at the end to perform the classification with a softmax classifier. Um, in the end to put it into the probability distribution from let's say 10 classes, zero to nine. 
And then I did a model fit based on, on train and you know test data. But you see, it, it's really not fundamentally changed. But of course, the beauty is in the detail. It's still a code that you have to refresh and you know revisit. Now we want to basically um, clear all outputs again. That's what we know and want to execute it. I put now everything in one cell um, because here we don't have now time to go again through every little detail and it's quite overlapping what I already talked about you. We have to you know, shape it a bit, but not completely flattened into it. We normalize it and then essentially create similar convolution, convolutions here. But the beauty is um, that you basically see here when we now do this, we have to download the data as we did before um, from this NumPy array, and we put it into this two different um, training and test sets. We see it takes a little bit longer before it starts because now what's happening, we upload data to the GPU, right? The, we download data on the CPU and have to give the data to the GPU because it can do nothing else and compute. But as you see here, you know, this is growing extremely fast. And this is probably not even a cutting edge GPU because the tensor operations, like also my previous speakers, you know, Rocco and Gabriel were alluding to, uh, was just having a lot, a lot of, lot of interactions. Um, this is basically now just beautiful for this tensor operations, which are nicely parallelizable. And with this, a GPU makes really sense to use. And of course we had here just 10 epochs. So when we now uh, increase the epochs, you feel the, the power of that much more. Right, so here we have 10 epochs, which was half of the one from last time. The batch sizes we have a little bit different, but this is all, of course, these kind of hyperparameters I was saying are usually problematic. Now let's see what comes out when we do it a little bit longer in the epochs, just catching up with our slides toward the end of the part two. I raised the issue that versioning matters and you see that also in tutorials, codes. Here is a, let's say, very nice tutorial if you want to know more. And essentially the whole page, Machine Learning Mastery, is a very nice example um, when you want to learn more about this. I'm not related to this. I'm just pointing out that, you know, this is some interesting resource for you. And also they have to update for Keras 1, then for Keras 2, another change in Keras 2, 2. So you see, that's a common modus operandi over the years. And you don't have only Keras or TensorFlow. You have also the underlying CUDA and so on, which should be installed properly. Now, the last slide, so to speak, of the course uh, is really then today making the case that we are just facing the start of it. Deep learning has been uh, actually throwing away what computer vision people were developing over many decades, having a new learning model, which actually works extremely well. So what neural architecture search is as a new research endeavor, so to speak, really cutting edge with automated machine learning is to understand, can I have, you know, these architectures learned. So you not only learn the data, so to speak, you learn how to learn automatically. And you have the different ways how you can do it. Here's an instance aware neural network, which says, depending on what um, image I have, I maybe have different networks different child architectures that can, you know, cope with different problems. But all of them have, of course, in common that basically you would have um, the one which is a task dependent objective saying, you, of course, you want to have still very good accuracy on the pictures. But on the other one, you have an architecture dependent object objective, for instance, by basically lowering the latency, making it faster or less resource intensive, of course, keeping the accuracy. And and all of these neural architecture approaches and in a way also the AutoML architectures and approaches to it have also the point that they're computationally very expensive because now you're not talking about, you know, doing a deep learning for solving a task. You're doing deep learning to learn the architecture for performing deep learning on a task. So your meta, so to speak, some people refer to it as meta learning, right? So this is, a very interesting approach, many publications in 2019, 2020. Uh, we will see a lot of more of those because essentially what it says is we humans are too limited to create good architectures for it, while the machine can do the job just nicely automated. And if computing costs would go down, we will see that in the future more evolving to simple tasks. Um, you know, examples are there already with autonomous search and rescue drones, which will be extremely accurate in the future, perhaps solving also and helping us as you know, humans 
that uh, have, let's say, good things to come. Of course, as university professor, I also should outline, we have there, of course, also some, let's say, risks. Some of you maybe know the military robots coming from Boston Dynamics, which is the other side of the equation from the rescue drones, maybe forcing us to a world which is also, you know, consider raising ethical issues. And with this, I want to close. I think here what we see is maybe um, there will be areas where from the technology we could do things, but from the ethical perspective, we shouldn't do things. With this, I'm done for today. Thank you very much for joining in, also for our invited uh, guests today for this practical lecture. And we continue with lecture eight with infrastructure as a service models uh, basically on Thursday. See you then.